Okay, in this chapter we talk about general definition of vector spaces. So we've seen Rn and properties of Rn. And Rn is going to be sort of our standard example of what a vector space should look like, what a nice, well-behaved vector space should look like. But there are other examples, some which are very practical and important in different aspects of mathematics. All right, so let's go on and look at some of the properties of vector space, and these are properties that are properties of Rn. So we've seen that when we talk about vectors, we focus on two operations, addition of vectors and scalar multiplication. So those are the two basic operations whose properties will define the property of the vector space. And some of these properties of these two operations you've seen before in other contexts. All right, so here we define a vector space basically as a set with two operations plus and scalar multiplication satisfying the following properties for all vectors u and v and for all scalars c and d. All right, so I'll go through this list quickly but just notice that you have out of closure, out of community, out of associativity. These are properties of real numbers as well. Some of two real numbers is a real number. Some of two vectors is a vector. Uh, uh, real numbers commute, vectors also commute. Real numbers are associative, vectors are also associative. So these are properties we've seen before. There is a special zero vector, so this is what you would call the additive identity, additive inverse. So in fact, these first several properties are saying that the vector space is an additive group. And uh, uh, if you don't know what group is, you'll, you can file that away for your later uh, understanding, but that's all these properties can be summarized in that way. All right, so then you have multiplicative closure. So we finished with the additive properties for now, and we also have multiplicative properties that a scalar multiple times a vector is still a vector. And then we have distributivity. Now we've seen distributivity before with with plus and multiplication in real numbers, but we have you have to notice something here. In this case, the scalars are a different type of object from the vectors. This looks just like distributivity in real uh, numbers, but it's not quite the same because these c plus d are scalars and this v is a vector. So you have this scalar multiplication distributes over addition of scalars. So you can add two scalars and multiply. That's the same thing as adding the scalar multiples. And distributi you have distributivity over uh, summation of vectors, that you can add two vectors and multiply by a scalar. That's the same thing as scalar multiplying and then adding. All right. All right. Then we have the uh, so-called associativity, which is not quite the same as associativity because, again, this multiplication CD is scalar multiplication. This uh, CD times V is scalar times vector multiplication. Really two different types of multiplication, although you use the same symbol. Then you have this property that any that this, there's the scalar one, which is a real number, times v is always equal to v. All right. Now here they point out that we've been using scalar product, which often occurs in vector spaces most of the time, but not necessarily all the time. A, a scalar product is a function from v cross v to r. Scalar product takes two vectors and, and produces a real number. That's not the same thing as a scalar multiplication, which, produce, which takes a real number and a vector and produces a vector. So just keep those two straight. This notation is worth understanding. Uh, if you don't follow this, look at it for a second and see if you follow what it's trying to say. All right, now, the first example is Rn. Now notice this n is different from what we've been looking at before. This n means the natural numbers. In fact, Rn you could kind of write as you think of as R infinity because you are actually taking an infinite sequence of numbers. Now you can write this also as a function from the natural numbers to the reals because for every natural number I have a real number. This natural number is the index in this representation. So in, for instance, in this case this f would f of 3 would be 27 because the third component of, of f is 27. f of 1 would be 1, f of 2 is, is uh, 8. And in fact, the general rule is f of n equals n cubed. Right? So we can represent this function f of n equals n cubed as an infinite vector like this. 
Now, does it satisfy the vector space properties? Well, you can run through the properties. You can kind of see that no matter how long this vector is, you're going to have all of those properties hold. So the same way you prove that R2, R, that R2, R3, and so on are vector spaces, you'd also prove that Rn is a vector space. Same kind of deal. Now, rather than representing these functions, or, or these infinite vectors rather, as a vector, he's representing them as a function because, as we said, we can uh, it, I think of these lists of this column of numbers really as a representation of numbers. Another way to think about this is beside this column of numbers, write the column 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's just like a two column representation of this function. Now, we don't write the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but we can understand that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is the index for each entry here. So that's how you can think of that. So the sum of two functions is a uh, uh, sum of two functions of a natural number is still a function of a natural number. All right, and then of course the if you take it there's a zero function where all of these entries are zero and you could add that to another function and you still get the same function. So all of these properties do follow from the properties of real numbers. Now it turns out another example, which is even more complicated, is real valued functions of a real variable. Now before remember we had Rn. Now n we can list the items in n. You cannot list the items in R. So how would you represent RR? Well in fact that's just a function from the real numbers to itself. You would represent that as a graph. And now you think about graphs of functions, you can add functions, you can multiply functions by scalars, and they have these same properties. For instance, you can add two functions, uh, f plus g, and you can add g plus f, you get the same result. And you could run through that list, and you could show that all of the properties in that vector space list are satisfied by uh, real functions of real variables. So that's another example that you might not expect, that real functions of real variables are form a vector space. Now here's another example of a vector space that derives from the previous example. And the, in fact, this is a very important type of example. Here we're taking functions from the real numbers to the real numbers such that the derivative of the function exists. This is a subset of the previous vector space that we talked about. It's a subset of the function from the reals to the reals. But it's the subset of functions that satisfies this property. And we actually call this a subspace. We'll be talking about that later. Now, not every subset of the functions from real to reals is a vector space. Turns out that it's only a vector space because the, because the derivative is a linear function. We've talked about linear functions before. So, uh, so if we define this linear function, then the linearity properties of DDX makes it possible to uh, to prove all the vector space axioms. And you can run through those and see. Now I just mentioned in the previous example that the set of functions whose derivative exists is a subset of the set of all real valued functions. Now here we have another case where we have a subset of Rn which is also a vector space. Rn is a vector space, and this subset is also a vector space. This is a solution set to a homogeneous equation, mx equals 0. m is a matrix, x is, a, is your vector. In this case, it's going to be a uh, vector in R3. And you can prove that uh, the set of all vectors x in R3 that satisfy mx equals 0 does, in fact, form a vector space. In fact, the set of the set of all vectors that form that satisfy this equation can be written as an arbitrary linear combination of these two vectors. And in fact, you can show that any arbitrary linear combination of vectors, uh, I'm sorry, the set of all linear combinations of some set of vectors will always be a vector space. For example, if I take two vectors of this form and add them together, then there will still be an arbitrary linear combination. That's what's shown down here. Here, have a, here I have a linear combination of the two vectors. You have another linear combination of the two vectors. Of course, you can combine this one with this one, and you can combine the second with the second and get the sum of these two vectors. And this is simply a linear combination of those vectors. So it still satisfies this form that needs to be satisfied. 
Okay, this example is called a subspace, and we'll see more about that in chapter nine. Okay, and this type of subspace is called a kernel. The kernel is kind of the the nut or the uh, the the important part of the that that relates to this linear function. So we'll talk a lot more about that later. Now we've talked about how the solution set to a homogeneous equation is a hyperplane. It's a particular hyperplane. And in fact, it's a hyperplane that contains the zero vector. And in fact, any hyperplane that contains the zero vector is a vector space. Because in fact, any hyperplane that contains a vector that contains the zero vector is the, uh, is the solution for a homogeneous uh, uh, set of equations. Now, just to amplify on that previous example, instead of taking two vectors in Rn, we can take two vectors in Rr, which is the set of real valued functions. We can take the set of arbitrarily new combinations of these two fixed functions. And that set of arbitrarily new combinations of these two fixed functions does form a vector space. It's closed under addition, closed under scalar multiplication, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. It's actually not too difficult to prove that such a subset is a, a vector space once you've proven that the big space is a vector space. And we'll be talking about that in the subspaces sub chapter. Now you can also build up vector spaces from vector spaces. For example, consider R2. R2 is, uh, consists of all vectors with two components. Now I could take another vector with two components and just concatenate it on the bottom. And that would give me a vector with four components. So basically, I've taken two copies of R2 and put them together. Well, that's what you're doing here with this cross product. You're taking a vector from one vector space and a vector from another vector space and basically concatenating them together. And that's always going to be a vector in a larger vector space that is called the cross product of those two individual vector spaces. And we'll see examples of that later. So for, I mean, the, the easiest example would be R cross R, which means R, R itself is a vector space. R itself is a vector space. If we take R cross R, we get two components, which is R2. So uh, we can see that this is the way, technically, that you construct R2 mathematically. It's by the cross product of R cross R. Then to get R3, you cross another R, etc. All right. So. All right. Now here we give several several non-examples. And uh, you show that to show that something's a non-example, all you have to do is show that some axiom fails. For instance, here we have a set. It's not an arbitrary set linear combination. It's an arbitrary multiple of this plus one zero. And it turns out that zero zero is not in this set. Now that's often the property that fails. That's the first thing to check. If you're looking at a set and you want to know whether it's a vector space, uh, first thing to check is is zero zero in that set. And then you might have to check some other properties later. All right, so here you have a set where it's not closed, and so on. All right, let me just say a few words about this next section. In the previous section, we've talked about our scalar multiplication, meaning we multiply vectors by r. Now, it turns out that we can have different kinds of scalars. And it gets more complicated that way. In fact, instead of choosing R as our set of scalars, we can choose the complex numbers as our set of scalars. And here they talk about some examples. You could also choose the rational numbers as your set of scalars. And there are other possible sets of scalars. Now, the set of scalars needs to satisfy some properties. And these properties are called the field properties. So basically, uh, Q and uh, C, they both have a addition and a multiplication. And they have uh, uh, inverses, except that the, the, multi the zero does not have a multiplicative inverse. So that's basically what a field is. Um, so I just want to make you aware that you can uh, have scalars that are not just in R, but in this book and throughout this course, mostly we'll be working with the field R, which we're comfortable with. Okay, that's it.